Cool. Um, hello, I'm Kevin. I wanted to say I've been a, uh, I've attended multiple owns of these, almost every single one, and I've never made myself lunch for these, except today I did. I made myself carrots, and then it was like 10 minutes ago that I realized that I was presenting. <laughs> um, so that's I, silly, but okay. Uh, I'm Kevin, as you said, I am an MA in art history at ASU. I did my undergrad at ASU Online in art history also, and the Wingate Curatorial intern working at the ASU Art Museum since about September, um, actually. So I am talking about Richard Notkins today, Artist Therapy in Our Times. Richard Notkins is a ceramics artist, been working since the 60s and 70s, mostly. He's still alive, uh, which is uh, one of the few one of the handful that are in our permanent collection that is still alive, as well as um, one of the, I think one of the first ones that we've talked about, I have to go back and look at them. I think of the masterpiece at middays of one of the living artists that we have. But here he is on the screen. Uh, he's a, a handsome looking guy. He's really fun. If you watch, I encourage you to watch some of his interviews on YouTube. He's a, seems like a really genuinely nice guy, not pretentious at all. Uh, but more about Richard Notkins. He was born in 1948 in Chicago. It was right after World War II, and this had a huge impact for him uh, because it was the aftermath of World War II. His parents were very political and social after World War II in, in terms of how society should go, in which direction. His father was an immigration lawyer, helping uh, a lot of Chinese immigrants become citizens. And that had a large impact on Richard Notkins in terms of his teapot viewings because his parents were gifted a lot of, of Chinese uh, ceramics and teapots. And we can get into some of that later also. Uh, in 1970, he got his Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Kansas City Art Institute, which was the height of the Vietnam War, which he was adamantly against. He participated in protests on campus and he sent a letter to the draft board that he wasn't going to go. He did actually to the, 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 the physical, uh, but he did not pass. So he didn't have to go and then he wasn't a conscientious objector. Uh, but because he didn't go to the war in Vietnam, he went and got his master's of fine art uh, at the University of California in Davis, where he studied under Robert Arneson, which is um, on the right here. There's a, that, so sorry, I should have started with this. The, top picture of George W. Bush is a piece that Richard Notkins did. And I think that I put the other picture underneath the attribution of it. So I apologize for that. Uh, but those are tiny little ceramic squares. Uh, they're about three inches. And then they each, there's a zoom later on, they each had their own image carved on them, which he carved himself and then put together to make George W. Bush. But he, while studying at University of California, Richard Notkin studied under Robert Arneson, who he described as being very difficult and intense, but it gave him a very independent learning, which was something new from Kansas City Art Institute, which he described as kind of hand-holding for his ceramic and um, studies. But working under Robert Arneson, who was, I posted this picture because he's, uh, Robert Arneson was a very political and very outspoken uh, artist himself, and that is where Richard Notkin says that he started to get some of his momentum and some of his, his voice when doing some of his artwork and creating was that difficult but intense and positive overall time that he spent studying with Robert Arneson um, during his, his master's. In 1982, that's around the, the time that he started um, making these teapots that are going to be on another slide future. But he started his work with teapots, uh, inspired by those in Yijing, China, with their intricate designs and their very functional uh, standard designs of teapots, which he had seen start originally from his parents. And then, of course, um, that it was gifted from his parents. But that was the 80s or his teapot phase. So in 1994, he moved to Montana, which uh, he still lives. And he suffered partial loss of vision in his eye. So he had to sort of change his form from doing large scale ceramics um, to new forms and still making teapots, but very limited. And then going into very intricate and small detailed pieces where he could spend a lot more time on carving out the detailed images uh, 
and he continued speaking about his anger, of course, in 1994, there was uh, a few wars going on, and then t today, still speaking about, as we saw from George W. Bush, um, and even to very recent with current affairs and wars going on. Um, and we can talk more about the therapy aspect of his losing his vision and how that coming about, how to work again, uh, learn, relearning that through art enabled him to like art as therapy in addition to that. Uh, so a lot of what we know of about Richard Notkins is teapots. A lot of what the ASU Art Museum has in their collections are going to be teapots and as well as the cups. So why did why teapots? And that's a sort of overall ceramics question, uh, especially I was brand new to ceramics when I started at the ASU Art Museum. Um, I didn't know much about it, but there's just teapots everywhere. And so one of our exhibitions that we have on now has just a lot of teapots. But um, so for ceramic artists, teapots show skill, combining functionality with artistry. So as we see here, this is similar to a piece that we have in, uh, this is the piece that we have in the ASU Art Museum, the one on the right. And so it, it breaks that idea of what a teapot is. It's, it's still functional, but it's now no longer looking like a traditional teapot, which we have on our left, which is one of, an example of the Yijing teapot from the Shanghai Museum in the 1900s. But they date back to the 15th century, some of the world's first teapots. Um, came from this area in China. And so these are some of the examples that he was seeing growing up as a kid that were gifted to him, his parents, um, early on. And so teapots for a lot of ceramic artists is a way to exemplify their skill at making a functional object, but you, being able to do that in a fun way that breaks the mold and expresses themselves and their voice as he is doing here with the cute little puppers in the fire extinguisher. So we have not your typical idea, IKEA teapots, short or stout. Uh, these are some of the examples of the teapots that Richard Notkins is making where they are functional, but they are breaking that idea of what a teapot is, uh, which a lot of ceramic artists are doing. But he's going as far to the idea that you, some of his, you have to be told that it's a teapot, you would have no idea. There's one that a really great one that I couldn't find an image of, only videos, which again, if you watch some of his uh, interviews on YouTube, you can see it one, but he has the rubbles of a World War II building and it's a larger scale and it is a functional teapot, but just looking at it, it looks like he had built a replica of the ruins of a building in World War II and it's astounding. But these are functional pieces. So we have the atomical heart and then we have this metal scraped skull, which is, and then again, we have another one that's like the uh, the previous one with the fire hydrant. And so he quotes, I use a teapot only metaphorically, really. I'm more interested in conveying ideas than I am in tea. And that sort of exemplifies my point earlier that while he's making functional teapots, it's not quite so much about making a functional object as it is exemplifying your ideas and your skills. So some techniques is um, he, in 1996, he started moving to reduction fire and a gas kiln, which I had to spend a lot of time on, um, while still using a slip casting and mold making. Slip casting and mold making kind of go hand in hand with the reduction firing, but reduction firing is just the removal of air from the kiln, providing a different look and clay than normal kilns. Uh, he said that he started to use the reduction firing because he was getting bored of the other kilns methods that he was using, but as well as it was a little bit easier once he lost his vision to switch to a reduction. Uh, he does talk about having a lot of loss with learning this technique, but it was part of the process. And then Richard, of course, he's been working since the 70s, so it's a very long time, 40, 50 years that he's been working. So he talks a lot about, in general, about getting bored with an idea and a process, and so trying to switch it up. And he learned that from losing partial vision, that it was really exciting and difficult to being challenged by a new process and a new technique or a new way, way of thinking. So the uh, reduction firing I included because I think that that was really interesting and I had never quite learned or seen about reduction firing. So it removes all of the oxygen from the kiln. So when you're looking at, this is a, a poor picture, but you can see the fire, it's obviously open air, but once that's shut, the oxygen is gonna be removed. So it reduces the oxygen in the kiln. Uh, and so it creates a lot of cracking in the process. Uh, and so he has a lot of loss, as I had just said. 
So there are a lot of things to be angry about in this world. I deal with it by making art, says Richard Nutkins. He actually talks about it. things happening in the world, pisses him off very greatly in an in interview. Uh, and is very adamant about it. So he's always been a protester. He's uh, angry about the past trauma of human error, war, genocide, hate, and then repeating of these mistakes immediately. He talks about in the same generations, Bill, you know, referring to the multiple ongoing wars in America that we're having been learning from. Here are some example of teapots and mugs that he has of weapons of mass destruction featuring, you know, the atomic bombs. And he started using on the one on the left here an ear motif as the handle. Ears are coming up a lot of in his later work too, to the idea of like not listening to past mistakes and not listening to what people are telling you. But this is another great example of here is a set he has of a teapot with multiple mugs. And if they were just sitting on a shelf, it would be very difficult to discern that they were functional objects to create and hold liquid and tea in and serves. And so they're representing a, an example and a point as well as being functional. And then of course, the one that's on the, I'm not sure where I put all of my attributions. Uh, I apologize for that. But the one that is in the middle, this teapot is very similar to the one that we have in the ASU Art Museum in our collection. Um, it's almost identical, it's just a little bit taller uh, than the one that we have in our collection. Richard Nockins makes not just teapots. So these are some of the examples from that earlier slide that I had on, uh, for, but the George W. Bush ones. These are uh, about four inches and then they are individually detailed, carved and pressed clay and ceramic earthenware, terracotta of different images usually representing war and hate and genocide. He keeps going back to World War II as well as contemporary wars with the, the bombings and the nuclear bombs. And then with these ones, he plays a lot with the idea of Earth healing itself after war and humans can do that same thing too. And that gets more into like the art and therapy that we'll get to later. But we have stumbled into the 21st century of technologies of Star Wars and the emotional maturity of cavemen. Uh, we can't find more creative solutions to solving worldwide social and political problems than sending young men and women to shred and incinerate one another's flesh with weapons of ever increasing efficiency. We will not survive to celebrate the passage into the 22nd century. Uh, so he continues to make ceramic sculptures which reflect on the social and political dilemmas of the world. Art is a revolt against man's fate, as Andre Malbro says. So this is the beginning quotes and ideas into the art as therapy in terms of Richard Notkins is struggling with the war and the ignorance of mankind with their killing. And this is his way, his outlet of dealing with that, as well as like speaking out and telling everyone this is wrong. But internally, this is a way for him to deal with his anger and not being able to physically solve it or which brings us to artist therapy versus art therapy I have a really really good friend Katie who is a, a clinical art therapist for um, in Colorado and so she helped me out a lot with this portion I just wanted to bring up some points before we move further further because there is a difference between art as therapy versus art therapy and so I don't want to get too far into it because it's extremely complicated, of course. Uh, but some general, very watered down uh, separations of ideas is artist therapy is on the left. So it's about ex personal experience, a process and a creative output. So you physically getting your hands in and doing the work and coming out with a process or a creative output. So making something and art as therapy is I use Richard Notkin's teapot on the right, is creating something and then having that being projection or an emotional exploration. So Richard Notkin's making this teapot of an atomic bomb and rolling the dice. And so what does that mean? So that's the, that's the difference in those two is artist therapy, anyone can do. Um, it's the idea of just getting your hands in, getting them dirty, making something yourself, and then letting your emotions drive that creation and that creative process. Artist therapy is doing that same thing, but then analyzing it uh, and saying, well, not saying, but coming up with a solution or a result to that. 
um, so like anger or depression or sadness or anxiety uh, because of some of those outputs. And again, those are very watered down. Um, there is a lot of overlapping in the two, but I didn't want to go too far into it for a 30 minute conversation. But overall, art as therapy, especially for Richard Nopkins, is a way to grapple with ideas. And so this goes back to the stone depth, the ear motifs. Uh, Richard Nopkins talks a lot about not being able to let go of those images from World War II and the Holocaust that he saw while growing up. And so a lot of his work has to deal with war, of course, that is still ongoing. We've never let it go. But that idea that growing up post-World War II, he saw the horrific images of the Holocaust and the war, and of course, seeing images of World War I. And so why have humans not moved past that? How can we have forgotten the atrocities of World War II in just a, such a short amount, in his lifetime, essentially? So he talks about, so he's created this project with the ears. So he stone, or he carves ears out of stone in different sizes and varying shapes. Each one is um, different. And he talks about the ears a lot of times through history being representation of the kills that you have gotten in war and certain tribes, as well as ears are from individual people. And so in this piece, which again, I don't have the accreditation, they must be underneath, but he represents it to the feet or the shoes from the Holocaust because he's not able to ever let go of that idea. So with him working with the ears, it's artist therapy. He's lit, it's an outlet for him to process and grapple with his emotions about the horrors of World War II and those images he saw growing up. Um, and there's not necessarily anyone there to analyze it, which is pretty obvious anyway, where he's going with. Um, but that is artist therapy, and this is a great way to sum that up. Uh, in a line with ASU, with we're working on too, you could do artist therapy as home, and now is the perfect time more than ever to do artist therapy at home when you don't have necessarily any other outlets like social outlets. Um, so I have some ideas. So creative outputs for art therapy, art as therapy as home, is like drawings, paintings, clay, some fine arts um, that we have on here with wood carving. Those are all able to do at home, but there's it doesn't have to be. Uh, fine arts as we have it could be creating beautiful food decorating a cake it could be flower arranging it could be um, fabrics uh, knitting so all of those things can be art of therapy um, that is accessible at home I have some pictures of this cute little cow on the clay on Amazon you can get a huge slab of clay for super cheap and they'll deliver it to you, you can get colors and paint and then I have a paint by number or color by number in there so I wanted to this is more in depth too but it's not quite art as therapy. Art as therapy is having something blank and then creating, bringing something out from you. But art, uh, color by numbers is a really great entry point, especially if you have kids and family. It's a great way to have everybody at least be somewhat creative. You can still choose the colors that you want to do too. Those are also really cheap. And for a lot of people like me, having a blank sheet of paper and paints is really intimidating because I just stare at it and like, I don't know what I'm supposed to create. Um, and that is part of the art as therapy process, but it can still be very challenging. So having something like a color by number, um, Katie was telling me, is a really great entry point into deciding what colors am I going to use? How do I want the vibe, the feel of it to look like? And then I can move on. Uh, so I encourage that to do. But at ASU Art Museum, once it reopens, we have a lot of hands-on projects for events. Uh, we have a workshop where you go in and we can make still life, which is from nothing. And then we can also make uh, bandanas and that's also starting with a blank slate and then you deciding what you want that bandana to look like and then for all of our events coming up we have uh, get weird which is coming up and they're gonna have lots of fun uh, little art supplies and then I posted some personal ones to sort of better exemplify because Richard Notkins obviously picked clay and clay as my friend Katie was telling me in art as therapy and art therapy is very tactile. So that's one of the best ways to go because you're physically touching the clay and moving it around. So for Richard Notkins, he found ceramics to be his voice and his outlet, but many, many other artists choose other formats. And I wanted to, on a personal level with working with Katie, I use artist therapy in a digital format using video games to deal with some anxieties that I have about time. So I have, Whenever I get free time, I get anxiety about how to spend that spare time. So if I have a few hours before bedtime, I'll panic 
about what I should spend that free time on that I'll end up not doing anything. And so working with Katie through artist therapy, we found some solutions, um, some digital sandbox. So games like City Skylines, which is a city building game, or The Sims 4, which I just build houses. I don't actually really play with The Sims that much because that's too much like real life with paying bills. But those are sandbox games where if you have a few hours, you can create from nothing. So you can have a blank slate and then choose what everything's gonna look like. So your house, you can shape color. The city, you can do the same thing. You can map out the roads. And those are very great for me to work through that anxiety about time because I'll have two hours where I have to start and finish. Whereas a movie or TV or books, those are narrative. I have too much uh, opportunity for me to be like, well, one more chapter, one more show, or um, not even started at all. So these are really great options for me, as well as clay. I also do paint by number two. Um, but I encourage everyone to try to look at Amazon. They have art supplies. That's where I found a lot of mine. Or maybe even the digital format. But, um, both of those video games are really, really cheap um, right now. You try your hand at that. So we have the ASU Ceramics Research Center, which is the, today's masterpiece of midday. And so I found this beautiful picture of it. And because it can be somewhat hard to find, I posted a picture of what the front looks like as well as the address. I'm sure almost all of you are familiar with it. But I also wanted to post, um, Katie is the clinical mental health counselor. Um, she is really great. She has this website, which I can also put in chat, has a ton of free suggestions and ideas on her website. Uh, there's no strings, no, no, not an advertisement. It's just to help people. There's lots of fun coloring ideas and things of that nature. Um, and I encourage her and she said to, to reach out to her if you have any questions uh, about anything that we talked about today is uh, not so much Richard Notkins, I guess, but uh, if there were questions that you wanted to do or have group projects uh, for free, you could talk to her about any of that um, in terms of art therapy. It's a really great idea. But I talked a little fast, and so I think I'm going to just move to questions. So we have any questions? I, I meant to have chat open, and then I didn't. So I'm sorry about that. But um, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm sorry. No, no worries. Um, do you, this is from your perspective of the research, research you've done and you've spent time looking at Richard's work. Do yeah. you think his process <laughs> has been helpful? Like, do you think he's been able to process these feelings? Like I, I see um, like a theme developing, right? Like this, this focus on war and, and then you can talk about artists developing kind of their own, pro, their own portfolio. So I, I wonder if started with like this art as therapy process and then he kind of became, he was known for that thematic and so can you talk oh. about that a little like do you think yeah so I'm not sure if especially in the 70s when he started if art as therapy and art therapy and certainly therapy in general is probably not very prominent uh for that time frame um especially something for men to be a part of if they're feeling emotional. I mean, look at all the people that came back from Vietnam that didn't have an outlet and PTSD uh, because it was sort of not acceptable or socially acceptable anyway to sort of seek help. So I'm not, I feel like he had, he has an art, all artists, I feel kind of do the same art as therapy, obviously, because they're all making art. Uh, but we just have some like Toshiko uh, for example, her is her work isn't necessarily political, but to say that she is not doing art as therapy uh, isn't quite accurate. So I don't think that Richard Notkins ever dealt with it. But as Katie described to me with art as therapy and art therapy, you're not looking for an answer or a solution. And I think that is the case for non-art therapy or art as therapy, that you're never going to get to the point where okay, well, I made this piece of art about war, so I'm okay now, and now I'm gonna make dogs for the rest of my life. So for Richard Notkins, I don't think that is the case. I think it helps him with his anger so that he doesn't sit at home and fester and then maybe drink all the time or you know get to a negative point. So I think it allows him to feel like he's doing something beneficial and he's warning people and creating that outlet, as well as I think that once you're an established artist that's known for these sorts of works, I think you kind of have a brand. 
um, and especially as he got older, um, I don't want to say you're stuck in that brand, but he likes that brand and likes what he's doing. Uh, he does branch out, but essentially he's just working with what he sees going on in the world and what he doesn't like. And um, he wants to be a small voice of change if possible. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> he spoke at the National Council of Education for the Ceramic Arts and SICA uh, the year uh, later. And he's still part. very um, political and he will express his views and also try to outreach to people to understand what's going on and have a voice and that sort of thing. So yeah, I definitely think that he is still promoting that and trying to make things better, if that makes sense. That was something that also came up with this interview a lot, uh, well not a lot, in one interview that I watched about him is that he tries to encourage people to not necessarily he wants people to get involved but educate themselves that's a that's a big theme also is that um, people don't necessarily know what's going on um, and I talk I think a lot of that might come back from like the World War II fallout what happened in World War II is a lot of people were saying they didn't know what's going on but his interviews are he's very articulate very intelligent it would be interesting to see how he feels about things right now yeah, I couldn't find like super relevant art that he was working on. There was an interview that he was doing uh, that came out in 2019, but it didn't really talk about some current work that he was doing. Um, we don't have just one piece in the collection. We have, uh, I think, 11 off of the top of my head. I think we have 11 pieces in our collection I think most of them are at the CRC. I think we might have one that's in the art and focus room at the art museum. Um, a lot of the pictures were difficult. And so I tried to showcase other ones too. A lot of his works, for example, he does a lot of anatomical hearts. So um, some of them are gold plated. Some of them are just earthenware and things of that nature. Um, sorry, I'm referring to Bobby's question in the chat. I don't think I mentioned that before, but, uh, and then a lot of them are gonna be skull-based, and so a lot of them are different variations. Uh, much like Toshiko, he wanted, he was striving for that, that, uh, not, I don't wanna say perfection, I don't think is the word that Richard would necessarily agree with, but uh, he was trying to create multiples of ones just to find the one that was right. Uh, so they're very much similar. So the anatomical heart, the skull teapots, et cetera, weapons of mass destruction pieces. So ones that we have in our permanent collection are very, very similar to the ones that we have on display, minus the contraception ones. I couldn't find a good quality photo to post for that one. Kevin, do you mind reading Bobby's question? I don't see it. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So Bobby, sorry. I, Technology, I'm just so used to it. So, do you, so Bobby's asked, do we only have the one piece in the collection? Uh, and the answer was no. We have about 11 or 12 uh, Richard Notkin pieces in the collection. Uh, a lot of them featuring weapons of mass destruction. So those cardboard box or wooden boxes that say WMW. Um, um, I might have gotten that wrong. Weapons of mass destruction, WMD. And then we have a uh, anatomical heart teapot by him. It's, I think ours is the gold plated one. Uh, and then we have a couple of the skulls at the CRC. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> I was struck by the phrase, um, is Richard Notkin is thinking about teapots as a metaphor. And I think that um, there's something really like frilly <laughs> about like a tea party, right? But then the sub his subjects are really, really intense and traumatic. But um, so I'm wondering what's your take on that, Kevin? Like in what ways, because there's two things that are so disconnected to me. Like how, did, how does he see a, a teapot as a metaphor? I, for me, it was kind of uh, a lot of like, I'm thinking, 
I don't want to bring up an artist. I, I think he's obviously he's accurate. Metaphorically, he's making a functional teapot, right? And so anyone could pick this up. You could buy this Ikea. I, that was, I forgot to even bring that up, but so you could buy teapots at Ikea uh, at Target and then they're just functional teapots. They're seven, $8, $10 maybe. I don't, never bought a teapot, but are those art, right? If you go to Ikea and you buy a teapot, is that art? Is that something that you could bring home and put on your shelf? And then you have guests over and like, look at my teapot. It's so beautiful versus these, these are the same thing. You could still serve tea in them. So, but the difference is that these are a message. And so I'm thinking of some Renaissance Baroque artists that would do live still life paintings, but the, the flowers and the fruit would be wilting. And so that sort of idea of, playing with the standard and playing with the metaphor of here is what beauty is. So and to get back onto point, I think what he was doing is intentional was these are a functional teapot and teapots are usually really nice to look at, but here we're looking at an anatomical heart with chains and a bullet in them. So that is a little unpleasant. And so is that actually functional any longer or this skull? So I think for him as a ceramicist, teapots are a way that a lot of the ceramicists showcase their skill. And so he didn't want to be bored and just do teapots. He had to do something like, uh, like a skull on that to be a metaphor about, you know, oh, so about tea and being a pleasant old English, old women sitting around having tea. Instead, he's wanting to have a message about, uh, I think it's independent of tea, but just like look at the skill that is creating and then look at the horror that's going on in the world of, uh, this one so the is a one that's teapot that isn't shown but it has the different layers of old uh war parts so cannons and swords and guns and dead bodies and then on the top of the plow and so that shows the, the healing of the earth and then why can't humans do that same thing too so that is a great message of the healing of all the past trauma but it's still like, here's the functional object and just a normal object. And I think these are doing the same thing also um, is that you could, the duplicity of the situation and the duplicity of humans, as well as the duplicity of uh, metaphorical teapots. Yeah, that was a little convoluted, but I had a lot of different ideas going on. Bobby has a question, Kevin. He asks, can you pull up the terracotta tiles and narrate them? Sure. Um, so before, let's go back to this one. We have George W. Bush that's on the top there. That's the same, that's essentially what we're doing. So then we have close-ups of these ones here, a similar one. So he's, he, with the teapots and the Netsuke, of Japanese, the idea of like having really small things that are extremely detailed. He was very fascinated with that. And so that's kind of where this project led him is finding these little tiles and then going very detailed, very small with the clay and then creating an overall narrative with them. So we have some of them, we can see various ones. So on this left piece on the right tile, we're seeing some like in the ground, some burial next to a destroyed buildings, bombs falling, a lot of World War II imagery. And then we also have down in the other one, we have some KKK, we have barbed wire, which is reminiscent of World Holocaust and then destroyed buildings. And so these all just narrate the ultimate idea of war is just destruction and death and chaos. And then I quoted it with his that we have the technologies of Star Wars and the emotional maturity of cavemen and so to me, that summed up these images and vice versa extremely well because we have these technologies, but here we're still putting people in cages and we're still showing hate and we're still destroying buildings that we've built. And so to me, that's his overall idea is just showcasing our errors and how we're not learning. It goes back to the ignorance that, that stone deaf imagery of his ears about this is all happening in single generations. So people are growing up with wars and then as an adult, they're propagating the wars still. No, there's no real learning or uh, growth coming out from that. Do you know how he makes those tiles? 
Is it a mold? He does mold them, yeah. So he spends time and then it's a really cool process. He It's like a press almost that he uses. So he put, he details the, the piece and then he puts it on a, a wooden press and he pushes that and it just stamps them essentially. And then he fires them. And so a lot of them crack and then he has to redo them, but he has that ultimate mold originally to go back onto. Yeah. And then putting them together is mind blowing. People that all do it with photographs is really crazy also. Um, that's a, that would be something really interesting to ask him about. Unfortunately, I don't have that answer. It's like the George W. Bush one to go back to that one. All of those, like that process of knowing ahead of time what like the darker ones or the wider ones to create an overall image. I think those are really amazing. Uh, and the scale of that, as we saw from this one of the George W. Bush one, which actually that's a not bad one. You can get a close in there. You see some ears and things in there. Um, it's pretty staggering to me, I think. Um, having that foresight, that's what I was looking for. Having that foresight of having the overall image while creating little tiny images and other scales too. Yeah. And are those, the images on the tiles, are they meant to be read left to right or is it just? I don't think that those are meant to be, um, I think I understand the question. I don't think that they're meant to have a narrative in terms of left to right. I think overall it is, um, I think I understand what, sorry, yeah. I don't think that they're, they're meant to be let, read left to right. I don't think it is telling a narrative, um, an overall narrative of violence and war and genocide, I think is the message that, but individually, I think he's just thinking of war and destruction and then what does that look like? Uh, he talks about art and violence going hand in hand, and then uh, that if we ever lost art, then violence would take over, and he thinks it would be the end of mankind, uh, which is a wild idea. Yeah. So, so I just had a thought, um, going back to Matt's question about using teapots. I wonder if um, he uses teapots because they are the most challenging form to actually build and then putting very challenging information on the pots to get this challenging conversations out. So I wonder if hand in hand. Absolutely. It's much more articulate for sure. <laughs> Mary Beth, could you actually, before we end, could you explain like, I don't, I don't know how challenging it is to make a teapot. <laughs> In all honesty, I'm, I'm ignorant to that process. What what makes building teapots challenging and why is it the quintessential form for ceramicists? Because you have to get every piece exact because you have to make sure that the teapot pours out properly. So it's, it's all these different um, pieces that have to come together so that it flows as one. So like the spout is definitely um, a challenge, the way that the handle is put on as far as picking it up and then tilting it to pour. So it's just, it's a challenging functional object, I guess, if that makes sense. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has anything else they'd like to ask or discuss. Nice job, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. Ceramics are difficult. Michael Sherrill, we have at the exhibition, he has a lot of teapots. And mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to articulate also is from, that was actually a prime example of getting into ceramics is why are there so many teapots? Um, but if you go to art museums also, or like um, and you go to the ceramics, you'll see a lot of teapots also. Uh, and that once you understand the, the skill level, I think it, it comes off as, uh, let me rephrase, knowing that now about ceramics and teapot being like the showcasing of the skill of the ceramicist's skill and understanding um, how that works, it becomes more understanding. And I think it would be a fun idea maybe for the museum to have a day 
and events where we get people to try to make their own teapots. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> I know, uh, the physics of it, it like it seems <laughs> you just make a, a you know a clay thing that's empty and has a spout and you're done. But um, the idea of I don't even know how ceramicist or Richard Notkins learns that because you have to learn the tilt of it. I mean, look at the skull one in the center to understand how the water would flow and it's, it's wild. And uh, once we're finally open at the CRC, we do have a lot of Richard Notkin objects out, but we also have a lot of teapots from artists, functional and non-functional. So, um, Yes, I will definitely give you guys a tour of our teapots once we're open. And I'm pretty sure that Richard Notkin's anatomical heart is in the art and focus room at the art museum. I think that one is on display. Yes. Um, and then the others are at the CRC, so you can check them out both. Kevin, quick question for you. Based on what... Uh-oh, we muted. There we go. Hopefully, I'll stay on. Okay, so based on what... You said previously where Notkin said, if violence won, art would be over, art would end. Vice versa, if art ended, violence would win. Art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has he ever responded to what he might otherwise be doing if there were no violence in the world? He did, actually. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, someone had, uh, there was an interview that discusses that, is that, uh, because his work is so violent. So similar to what Kat had asked earlier about um, that res resolution of artist therapy, if that ever like fixed him and so that he could go on to do puppies and that sort of, that sort of track record. Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't add it in here. <laughs> uh, so it's very clever, but he, I don't really, I don't want to put words into his mouth or articulate that, but I think he essentially comes up and says that he doesn't really agree or doesn't think that that is the, ever the case, that he would still be doing art, um, of course, because he is an artist, but there would still be something that he would represent that's not right in the world. Um, so it may not be war and genocide, but there would be some injustice that's happening that someone needs to speak out for, and he needs to be that voice for the people that don't have a voice. So as he likes to quote Gandhi as being like a, just a few sands in the machine can stop it over time. He wants to be just those few sands if he can. So even if he doesn't have an impact on anything, he has a lasting impact overall that some people will see and some people will learn from. And that's good enough for him if he can just reach out to just a handful of people, if not a mass market, then he's, that's good. He's content with that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I noticed there was a mistake in the first PowerPoint slide that I had up earlier. Oh. Our next meeting is on a Tuesday, not a Thursday. So Tuesday, June 16th at 12 with Ariana Enriquez, and she'll be talking about Adriana Vergel. So we hope to see you guys there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. I learned a lot. It was really great. I'm going to go get paint by numbers. <laughs> <laughs>